periodically share information and gather it in a manner and structure it in a manner that will be useful uh, for, for uh, all of us. But I was also going to say one word, if I may, about the, the situation of women. And I think a point was made that the scientists should be encouraged to work with the women too. And particularly when you are talking nutrition, it is the women who will be able to give you uh, the best advice. It's not just food, it's food and nutrition. And as they test and experiment, they usually deal with the, the, with the male farmers. We were in, in Mali, they are working extremely well, the farmers and the scientists. But most of them, the farmers who are working with were men. We saw one woman who is a, a seed breeder who started not long ago, was it severe about a year, or, a year ago? And now has, a, and also has an agro dealer shop, and she has 150 of them. She has a network of 150 shops around Mali, and she's constrained by her own capacity. She could grow much faster. And, and here the scientists are working with her breeding, so there is a capacity in the, uh, on the ground with our women, which is not fully exploited. But I agree with you on the monitoring and evaluation. We will keep at it. I, I still would like somebody to address the question of, you know, all of us having consensus that women need to be part of the decision-making process. However, are they being made part of, of that decision-making process? Sylvia, you, you, you specifically alluded to that. In in some cases, certainly, there is actually in the room a ward, which is an organization that actually uh, that we at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have funded that specifically has women breeders, funds women breeders. I've had the opportunity to meet those breeders. They are making the decisions of what crops to try, working with their governments and representing the research centers. And so then you have women in those positions. The woman that uh, was just referred to in terms of making decisions. When you have 150 agro-dealers working for you, you're in a position to start influencing and making decisions. So I think it is about creating the push and making sure you acquire that. And we try and do that in our grant making with our partners and then having that once you get a group to build the power of the voice. I think there are two other ways that we haven't mentioned. One is I just came from Kenya. Kenya just celebrated its new constitution. And so enacting a constitution there where 30% of women will now play a role um, in government is another important way of ensuring. And the final way, I think, is by grappling with property rights and land tenure issues, because ultimately mm. the women smallholder farmer needs to be protected in that way as well. Mr. Prime Minister, you, and then I need to go to the floor. Please go Okay. Ahead. You, you raised the two issues, which I think are good. Of course, we, were dis we just completed discussing, but I, th I thought I should go back to it. How do you get women involved in the process of decision making? Um, what, what you need here is, is, is first a policy outlook that looks at women as part and parcel of development of any country. Okay? Now in the case of Tanzania, that, that is no longer a debate. It's now something that is entrenched, facing the Constitution. Okay? Parliaments, the, our parliament in Tanzania must have not less than 30% of the members who are women. And this time we are moving to 40% in our elections. That must be looked at, because when you look at the parliament, it's much more of a national structure. But you have got to get down now to the district level and see the kind of governance that exists in those areas. We are using the local government system. And under the law, not less than 30% must be women in all councils. Okay? And that goes down up to the village because we've got these village governments, not less than 40% in case of the villages. So I think if the governments of Africa were to look at it from that angle, place them in the appropriate legal instruments, then there would be nobody to change this phenomena in the long term to come. And I think it's significant, it's very, very important that we go by that kind of an approach. 
But I thought I should also chip in a little bit with regard to the youth. You posed a very good question. What is that makes the young man not attracted to agriculture? And therefore, what should you do in order to make them be attracted? You see, what makes the young man run away from agriculture is the order that one goes through in the farming process. The tilling of land is tedious. For somebody who has gone through some education, he wants to see how you are handling or you are dealing with the question of agriculture in a much more better, simpler way, something that will make them attractive. So in our case, what we've done, first create groups, young men and women groups, who are fully attached to agriculture. Then see if you can provide things like power tillers, small tractors, um, animal power uses, in order to simplify the methods of agriculture. And that has worked very well. And if you were to come to Tanzania, I would take you to some of the areas where the youth are no longer talking of going to town because they are paid better, they get more money, but it's because we have used the method of mechanization, simple mechanization, in order to make agriculture a little bit more you know, attractive. And then provide the market, offer them good prices, then you have no problem. Okay, there is somebody at this microphone at the bottom. Please identify yourself and be as brief as you can, please. Thank you. My name is Kola Masha. I'm uh, from Dario Partners, an agricultural venture capital firm based in Nigeria. My question is to Judith Roden from the Rockefeller Foundation. I'd like you to expand on your thoughts on the role of impact investors on solving this challenge, particularly how they might be able to overcome the, uh, the challenge around that they may not be development focused enough for the development organizations or the public sector, but might not be profit focused enough for the private sector investor. Thank you. Um, there are three ways that impact investment now in, in the way your question addressed it can accelerate um, agriculture in particular. One is by aggregating funds so that there really is a broad array of funds that are going into then smaller sized African agriculture funds that are on the ground that are developing agribusiness. Um, for example, TechnoServe is doing a, an agricultural accelerator approach, so using new kinds of technology that are absorbing impact investor funds that really aren't able to identify the business. So bringing these funds together in new and creative ways. A second way that impact investing is, is um, putting money to work is by mitigating risk for the larger scale commercial investors. So if it seems like it's a risky investment, if it seems like a, a large bank doesn't want to give credit to the smallholder farmer, the impact investor often can create the first layer of risk capital, and then the larger scale investor is willing to come in as the senior debt um, in this kind of market or the senior equity. And we've seen hundreds of millions of dollars begin to be invested in that way when the first tier of risk capital is provided by the impact investor. The third way is really by accepting a kind of global, if you will, rating agency for the businesses. One of the problems for the investors is often that they know how to do the financial due diligence, but they don't know how to do the social due diligence. So Rockefeller, in addition to uh, creating the Global Impact Investors Network to aggregate um, the investor community, has also worked to develop a global impact investing rating system. And businesses now will be able to be rated so that the investor is able to really see in this rating system that the social due diligence is there, that it's really a, a, a very compelling one, a very transparent one. And that is adding a great deal of confidence. So we think that the field of impact investing, which is going to span venture capital, equity, and debt investing, so every element um, of the chain of investment capital can be brought into an impact investment instrument that yields both financial and social returns. The kind of information he's asking for will have to come from the governments, the government in question, but we in Agra encourage the government to take a holistic approach and work all along the chain. 
the issue of infrastructure which you've raised is an important one. 